Good afternoon and welcome. It's uh, 5.30 p.m. and I'm calling the May 4th, 2022 meeting of the Historic Site Preservation Board to order. And I would like to welcome Ken Lyon back on staff after being on leave for his shoulder. Welcome back, Ken, we missed you. Nice and to be thanks, back, I miss you all too. Yeah, and thanks David for filling in so nicely. Um, well, Ken was away. So uh, may we please have the roll call? Yes, Member Miller? Here. Member Hansen? Here. Member Rosenau? Here. Member Kaiser? Here. Vice Chair Nelson? Here. And Chair Huff? Here. You have a quorum. Very good, thank you. May we please have the staff report on the posting of the agenda? Yes, the agenda for this meeting was posted for public review at the City Hall Bulletin Board in the west side of the Council Chamber and in the Planning Department counter on Thursday, April 28th, and this is required by policies and procedures. Does the board have any revisions to the agenda? Okay, so may I have a motion to approve the agenda? Motion? Move to accept the agenda. Okay, um, is there a second? I'll second. Okay, so I have a motion by uh, Miller, uh, motion, <laughs> Member Miller, and a second by Member Rosenau. Uh, is there any discussion about the agenda? Okay, seeing none, um, a call for the question. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Okay, motion passes uh, six to zero. Um, so next is um, public comment. Uh, this is the time that's been as, uh, set aside for members of the public to address the Historic Site Preservation Board on um, agenda items and items of general interest within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. Although the Historic Site Preservation Board values your comments uh, pursuant to the Brown Act, it generally cannot take any action on items that are not listed on the post agenda. Um, there will be three minutes uh, for, uh, e for each speaker testimony for public hearings. That's going to be a little bit later, a uh, later time at the meeting. So um, staff, has anyone requested to comment on a non-public item or any item that's not on today's agenda? No one has asked, but I see uh, Mr. Burkett has his hand raised. Mr. Mr. Burkett. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to take this opportunity um, to uh, about the preservation matters event, um, and you know the entire board and the event committee and staff should really be patting themselves on the back. I got to tell you, it was uh, you know from my sitting back to where I was, it was an amazing uh, event, and I've heard so many wonderful comments. Uh, that this was really one terrific year. So uh, I want you to take a deep breath and then um, <laughs> here, uh, you know, in a month or so, then um, start planning for 2023 because that's what it takes, believe it or not. Um, and the other thing I wanted to share with you are about projects um, that I would urge you um, and inspire you to keep uh, just a careful eye on. Uh, the architry tree, as we all know, there was a, a fire there, but uh, recently, but I must say, uh, I, walk, I, I went by the site right as soon as I heard about the fire. And then two days later, the fence had been put back up to protect the property. So I must say that that was, uh, and it was done over the weekend, which was really quite amazing. So, uh, but obviously that needs constant um, attention just to, just to keep your eye on it and drive by there once in a while because there have been, as we know, breaches from time to time. And that's when you reached out to the code enforcement. That's been the protocol with the board uh, as the direction to go uh, when you see these kinds of things. Uh, the other is the town and country. There appears to be a 
ongoing projects, such some sort of a plumbing project. And I totally understand that. I'm not complaining about that at all. All I am wanting to bring to your attention, there are huge gaps that have been left there for at least a week. I have no idea when they plan to resume the, the work on the, um, on the center on this project. But um, I would urge again that reach out to the code enforcement and I'd suggest asking if they could uh, make arrangements to have that, that fence back up until they're ready for the next phase because it is just an open invitation to this point. And we had to watch this property on a constant basis and we certainly don't want to lose it. Uh, just to keep your eye on the Racket Club vulnerability. And the last thing is on the main library, it's actually on the council agenda list for capital improvements projects. So that looks like that may be coming back on stream. And uh, so that would be uh, another interesting development just to, uh, again, really keep your eyes on. Listen, I thank you so much and um, keep up the great work. Uh, you guys are really terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burkett. And we appreciate you too and all your comments. Are there any other speakers uh, at this time? Any other speakers? Okay. Um, seeing uh, no additional speakers, we will proceed to the uh, consent agenda, um, which is the approval of the minutes from April 5th, uh, the HSPB meeting. Are there... Um, any revisions to the minutes of April 5th? Uh -huh. Member Hansen? Yeah, on the bottom of page three, the last paragraph, my last name is spelled incorrectly. Okay. It's, it's fine in the rest of the document, but it should be okay. in, the e, in the E and not an O. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay. I, any other revisions to the minutes? Any other? Okay. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the uh, minutes of May uh, of uh, April, April, no, May 4th with the correction that uh, Member Hansen made. Okay. Okay. We have a motion by Nelson. How about second. a second? Second. Okay, second. Okay. Motion by Nelson, second by um, Janet Hansen. Um, is there any discussion about the minutes? Okay, I'll call for the question. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? Okay, motion passes uh, six to zero. Okay, let's proceed to item, agenda item 2A, public hearings, application by Carlos Sarreo and Monica May, owners for historic designation of the Robson and Helen Chambers residence located at 695 South Warm Sands Road. May we please have a staff report? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. As noted in your staff report, the owners are seeking historic designation of the Robson Chambers residence. The home was designed by Robson Chambers as his family home, constructed in 1946 with additions by Chambers in 1950 and 1956. The Chambers lived in the home until 1961, and thus the period of significance in the report is proposed to be from 1946 until 61 when they did sell the home. Uh, in the staff report, uh, which is based upon the uh, historic resources report prepared by Stephen Vaught, who is here with us this afternoon, uh, <clears throat> we note that the house is particularly interesting, and I had an opportunity after the board tour to actually uh, visit the home uh, that following uh, afternoon, and it is really quite an interesting house. Uh, as you know, the building is uh, uh, a, a signature piece of work in terms of desert modernism uh, with its uh, use of uh, very simple and raw materials as finished surfaces and a lot of material that really was sort of um, coming out of uh, World War II in terms of technologies of various types of panels and plywood and so on. Uh, the home is in very good condition, and the, um, the current owners have uh, done a very uh, impressive job of the restoration of the home. The uh, project, in terms of its evaluation of integrity, 
Uh, we've noted in the staff report and in Mr. Vaught's report that there was an addition to the living room done in 1973, uh, and the perimeter garden wall was put in in 2019, um, but we do not feel that those are any kind of material impairment to the design integrity of the home. Of course, the setting has changed from the time the home was built. The neighborhood is now pretty much fully built out, so it's no longer that open desert that you would have seen if you'd been visited the home in the 40s, but other than that, it's materials integrity, workmanship, feeling, and association are all intact. So in summary, the home does qualify uh, both in terms of its criteria uh, as a class one historic site. On page seven of your staff report are the defining characteristics of the home, which include its flat roof, the deep overhangs and eaves, which are constructed of corrugated, cur curved corrugated metal panels, the large expanses of floor to ceiling glass, the open carport, the industrial use of materials for finished surfaces, such as flex board, corrugated metal plywood and pumice blocks for the fireplace, and its simple form with no ornament or decorative materials. The non-contributing elements at the site are the swimming pool, uh, the hardscape and landscape, the perimeter walls, and the screening around the rooftop mechanical equipment, which was not original. There was rooftop mechanical on the home, but as you saw in Mr. Vaught's report, the uh, equipment at that time was not screened. I do note in the report that the um, uh, report from Mr. Vaught does recommend that uh, the uh, Washingtonia robusta trees that are in the home's yard be included in the character defining features. Um, I tend to, as a general rule, not include landscape items. Now these were evidenced in the original photos of the home, you can see them when they're little tiny dinky trees, um, but I, they are very full mature trees. And my only hesitation on um, including them as a character defining feature is they do appear to be very close to the end of their life cycle. And uh, if the owner was to, if they were to become character defining, then they would have to go through some type of a certificate with the city to um, you know, get them removed and either replaced or not replaced. Uh, so that's your call, uh, and Mr. Vaught can probably speak further to it, as well as the uh, owners who are also here with us tonight. So staff recommendation is uh, to recommend that the house be forwarded to the city council with a recommendation for class one landmark historic designation. Uh, the owner is here, the author of the report is here, and I am here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lyon. So now is the time for a board to ask uh, questions of staff. And I would like to begin with a question. You mentioned the, the palm trees. Um, are they close enough to the house? You know how palm trees, you know, sometimes are so strong that they, um, you know, they up, you know, up, you know, they uproot other, other um, such structures and walls and, and cause some damage if they're too close to the house. Um, I, uh, is this any kind of a problem or you think for now? I didn't observe any damage to the, to the concrete surfaces or areas when I was there. Um, I don't know if the owners have observed anything uh, about that, but I did not observe anything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cause I know that can be a problem sometimes. So, okay. So opening uh, for the board to ask any questions for staff, any questions, please raise your hand. Member Hansen. Um, just a follow up question on your staff report. So if if they were character defining features and they needed to come out, they would have need a permit or a certificate of appropriateness to remove them and then would they be required to replant palm trees. Well, if they were to remove them and if they chose not to replace them, uh, that would be a C of a question if it was a situation where the trees had failed or they had begun to die or some other reason and they were replacing them, quote unquote, like for like, we would probably process that as a staff level approval with no review by the board. Okay. Is this the time for comments too, or were just questions from staff? Questions, questions for staff. Okay. Yes. But uh, any other questions uh, for the staff? Any other before, before we uh, open the public hearing? Any questions of staff? Okay. So, uh, seeing no further questions of staff, I will open the public hearing. Hearings open. <laughs> so uh, does the applicant, uh, applicants wish to speak? Um, would you like to speak? 
Sure. Hi. Hey, guys. Hi. Um, yeah. <laughs> we're just so, gonna... so welcome. I oh, just want to <laughs> welcome uh, uh, Monica May and Carlos Sorreo. And um, uh, you, you, you can state your names again, please. And, and you have 10 minutes. <laughs> it's a long time. To present <laughs> and, and then two minutes of rebuttal, uh, if desired, you know, after all the public comments. So so we uh, we welcome you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. I'm Thank Carlos, you. and this is Monica. I'm Monica. So uh, yeah, this is all you know, great fun. So thank you, and and like I said, we appreciate you guys uh, considering it. And it was also very nice to have some of you guys visit because you know people in person, you know, like <laughs> and you know and people who actually get the place. So that that was nice. Um, a little a little backstory on it. We we purchased the place jointly in in 2018, and uh, you know with just pretty much just on the feeling that we liked it. And then we started, you know, with, and the only information we had was that it was attributed, you know, somehow to, you know, um, uh, Albert Frey. And so we started doing a little digging and we, we got up to the uh, University of California, Santa Barbara and started digging some of the uh, archives and discovered Robson Chambers and how, how integral he was in some of the designs. And, um, and then just went, started going down the rabbit hole from there. So, uh, it's just at this point, you know, it's, it's just been a kind of a, a really nice learning experience, connecting all the dots and learning about vintage, how to install vintage plumbing and whatnot, but, you know, um, Monica. Yeah, I think, um, I think as what Carlos was saying, just the feeling about the house when we originally purchased it, we knew that there was something special about it. I think, uh, just the way the house is situated, the eaves, the glass on one side. And I know that these things don't typically look on the inside, but just some features that had been left and maintained through the course of the, you know, 76 years that it's existed is pretty amazing. So uh, I know that you guys all, you know, that were able to come were able to come and see the inside and things that we changed and uh, kind of tried to bring back in terms of certain finishes. But I think the thing that's really amazing and, and Ken touched on this is the use of the post-war materials that are still like a lot of them that are intact for the space, which we always called it sort of our little lab in the desert. <laughs> because it did just sort of feel like it was created and uh, created in terms of probably not only a portfolio piece for Robson Chambers, but to you know purchase a piece of land that was probably inexpensive, build a house that was using inexpensive materials and working alongside Frey during that time when before he was a partner, um, just staff at the firm was uh, kind of neat to find out. So thanks for coming by. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to speak on public comment? Um, if so, uh, uh, Mr. Vaught, uh, you have three minutes. Well, thank you. I hope I can keep it to that, but uh, I, uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm new to Zoom. <laughs> at this point I was the last person on it but um this house has just been a joy to work on uh it's an you know we always say uniqueness and and undiscovered treasures but this one really was because it's it's a modest house that you might pass by but not realize how important it was in terms of Palm Springs architectural history because it was fascinating to read and discover more about Robson Chambers obviously I knew who he was in the abstract but to get down into the details of this man who is sort of the third man as um, um, the late, um, I'm sorry, Lanky. Uh, anyway, that uh, it was uh, how talented he was. And this is a great look at his work on his own right at the very beginning. Uh, it's an experimental house, as Monica said. Uh, it was intended to uh, be a lab uh, for ideas that Chambers had along with Frey uh, to uh, create desert housing that would be affordable and also something that could be used year round, which was quite unique in 1946. And uh, the house was built for a remarkable $7,000 uh, plus, just amazing uh, with that. And it has withstood all these many years. I was also fascinated in researching it um, 
how much its integrity has remained uh, and because it had been so uh, loved by chambers through the decades uh, with that. I mean, many of these houses, as you know, many changes, but it's a very special house. Uh, it's a very early example of post-war uh, modern uh, housing done with like the raw materials, the, the things he learned about in World War II um, when he was working in the Marine Corps for the um, Corps of Engineers. And then also from uh, Albert Frey, who had, because this house is basically a, a very close kin to Frey House One, and uh, they are very similar in materials and philosophy. And this is a surviving example of that philosophy that Frey and Chambers brought to post-war Palm Springs. <clears throat> and so I will uh, wrap up at that moment. Good, thank you, Mr. Vaught. Made You're a very welcome. important um, concluding statement. Absolutely. Um, Mr. Lyon, are there any other speakers that we know of uh, to have public comment at this time? No one else has called or met or comment contacted us requesting to speak. Okay. So uh, do, um, do the owners wish to say anything else? Uh, any rebuttal of any type? <laughs> are you, any other? Okay. Yep. We Okay, thank you. So seeing no further uh, speakers on this item, I will uh, now close the public hearing. So now the action is with the board. And so it's up to the board now to uh, add comments and have uh, further discussion of this project. So board members, any comments? Member Hansen? I just, well, I always like to start with, I support the nomination in case anybody gets nervous that you're gonna you know, say something that indicates otherwise. But I just, I'm sorry, I did not get a chance to um, tour the property with the rest of the board. I was in Sacramento at a commission meeting there, um, but I did thoroughly read the staff report and I was a little disappointed that I also couldn't drive by and get a, a good view from the street at this point with the, the wall around it. But, um, uh, Mr. Vaught, great job presenting the history and development of the property. It was very clear, um, no questions on that. Thank you. Um, I was really intrigued by the fact that the um, expansion of the property over time was built into the original plans. And that was a concept, which I think is, I'm sure that probably happens, but maybe not so obviously where it's actually on the plans. And you can look at that over time in the report and see what happened. Um, and that it really is integral to the history of the property overall. So just thanks for being good stewards of the property. That's Thank my you. comments. Thank you. Other board member comments? Anyone else? Member Vice Chair Nelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just to thank uh, Carlos and Monica for your truly incredible attention to detail, your amazing restoration, and to Steve for this phenomenal report. Uh, they are always so enjoyable to read. Uh, you really do take the time to research every single thing and uh, bring the property to life in a whole new way from so many other authors. So thank you both, or thank you all rather for that. And um, just a personal note that I've driven by this property for years, having grown up here and uh, it's been interesting to see all of the different people who've owned it, some of whom were architects in the past, who, who all appreciated it in their own little way and added their own little thing and tried to do their, their thing. But now, truly, it's been brought back to uh, the level that I think Robinson Chambers would be very proud of. Um, I wanted to point out in the report that Steve Bart wrote on page 26, here, the Julia Schulman photograph that includes uh, the three palm trees in the backyard that were planted by uh, Chambers and his wife when they did the re-landscaping. And uh, I saw those when I was there and took a photo of them and they are quite tall now, of course. And so those are really part of original historic landscape, which have been well documented in the Schulman photograph. So there's been a lot of talk in Palm Springs over the last few years and a lot of recognition being given to historic landscapes and especially by our dear friend uh, Stephen Keelan. And I think it's really important and maybe this is an opportunity with this nomination 
to really say, you know, obviously the documentation is here from the Schumann photograph and we saw the palm trees and they appear to be well spaced and away from the house. So I think that uh, worth um, considering including them in this nomination as uh, important fabric for the historical landscape. And uh, I think that would be everything I have right now. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, board comments? Any other comments? Mr. Lyon? I just want to make a final footnote comment about the question of landscape. I don't have a strong opinion about it in this particular case. I guess the question that I would always ask is, if it was taken away, <laughs> do, does the, does it, would it materially impair the historic significance of the home? In other words, if the palm trees were removed, would it damage the historic significance of this home? And I think that's kind of an important question to ask when it comes to things like landscape. And it's also the question that I try to ask myself when I look at a particular uh, uh, nomination that's come before you is what things are there that are part of the original fabric, but also what things, if they were taken away, would actually damage the historic significance of the home. And I'm not going to opine on it one way or the other for you tonight. I just want you to keep that kind of question in your own head as you ponder this, this kind of question. Thank you, Mr. Lyon. Any, any other uh, comments from the board? Member Hansen? I would just be curious if um, the property owners, do you have any objection to including the palm trees in the nomination? Would you prefer not to, or are you good with it? I, I think we were speaking about, and, and to be honest, we, we wanted to defer to you, the experts on that. I mean, uh, Ken did bring it up uh, when he visited on site and it's our first palm tree. So we actually didn't realize to this call that they were near, near the end of their cycle. But, you know, that being said, you know, we would, you know, if, if the board decides because they're, you know, originally in those photos in 46 as little babies, if we needed to replace them, you know, we would be totally fine with that as well. So we would. You know. We just hope they keep living and staying exactly how they are. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I don't think either way we thought. It, it's definitely not something that we're considering like removing them, but I think Ken did bring up a good point and just the fact of seeing them in the photos, knowing that they were there and seeing them as small, small little triplets. <laughs> um, you know, you do start to wonder, well, if something happened, how does that, how does that work? And if one fell and you replace another, does that sort of also alter that sort of balance since they were all planted at the same time? So I, I don't know, that would just be a consideration to come up. I think also the board would need to consider this. This is something that future property owners would be subject to as well. I would just make the comment that I don't feel as, that strongly about it. I agree that, I mean, I think they're great. I love the idea they're in the original photo and they're part yeah. of the property, but I agree with staff that if they were taken away, you know, this property is really significant for its architectural quality. And I don't think that impacts that significance or, or its relationship to any of the criteria, but I would defer to the rest of the board members. Mm -hmm. Um, I would like to add that um, when, when the chambers built their house and, you know, they built those, uh, they planted those trees, you know, they were out in the middle of the desert and, uh, and they had, you know, beautiful, expansive views um, that, you know, that aren't really there now anymore. Um, it's, it's, you know, very, very uh, private and closed. Um, and, you know, you know, if, if, if they went away in 50 years, it would open up a different view, maybe. Uh, so I, it's, it's hard to, uh, uh, to uh, put that in, in, in context of what was then and, and what the future will be in regard to plants and, and views and that sort of thing. But I do want to uh, comment that it's uh, really significant uh, to, uh, to preserve an architect's own home, an architect uh, that, uh, that he could do whatever he wanted to solve problems and build for his uh, you know, wife and family and planning for the future. So this is a very significant um, preservation project 
especially because it was the architect's home. So, and thank you, Steve, for your wonderful report, very well written and beautifully illustrated. Love those, those photographs uh, and beautifully written. So thank you for informing us so very much about this wonderful uh, structure. Oh, you're welcome. It was great to have the opportunity. Yes, excellent. Uh, in any other any other board discussions or comments? Anyone else? Okay, seeing no further board discussion, uh, may I please have a motion? Member Kaiser, I move that we accept the staff report and the staff's recommendation as written. Okay, may I have a second? Okay, I'll Nelson, second. second. Okay, so um, so I have a motion uh, by Member Kaiser to accept the report as written with a, a second by Member Nelson. Is there any further discussion about the motion? Okay, seeing none, I'll call for the question. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the motion passes six to zero. So congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <guys>. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you both. Uh, uh, for the owners, this will be scheduled at some point in the near future for a public hearing of the city council to consider the board's recommendation this evening. And uh, we would invite you again to participate at that time as we do also to Mr. Vaught. And I would also from a staff level, uh, uh, thank Mr. Vaught for an excellent report. Thank you, Ken, very much. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Okay, moving on with our agenda, there is no unfinished business um, this evening and there is no new business either. So let us proceed to discussions agenda item 5A. And 5A is Preservation Matters Symposium. Uh, just do a kind of brief report for, for all and for the record. Um, you know, our preservation symposium held on uh, April 23rd and 24th at the convention center uh, was very well received and, and well attended with, you know, professional uh, presenters. And it was a very enthusiastic gathering. Uh, we had 15 sessions with 25 presenters. We held hands with 25 presenters <laughs> through many months of planning. And we were delighted that Trina Turk and Jade Nelson uh, were our delightful hosts who were absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, Mayor Middleton and Council Member Woods attended both days and presented the Honors and Recognition Awards to three preservationists, Dick Burkett, uh, Stephen Keelan, and our, and our own Ken Lyon. So congratulations to those wonderful uh, recipients. Um, you know, we printed this brochure um, that listed the programs with the schedule and the credits and, and all that information, um, a nice, nice takeaway and, and documentation. So I will compile comments that I've received from many people and from board members and committee members and, uh, and I'll compile all that and I'll pass it on to the next uh, symposium sub, subcommittee members. Uh, for their review in planning for the next uh, symposium. And as Mr. Uh, Burkett urged us to get working right away soon, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> so I wanna just give you an attendance report. Uh, so for day one, uh, 411 people registered online. Um, but while checking in at the registration desk was kind of, uh, uh, well, it was definitely a lower check-in. And um, it, it was kind of observed that people, you know, some people arrived late, some people didn't check in at the desk because they were rushing to get in and some came at intermission. And so it was kind of through the day, people, uh, afternoon, people came and, and went. So. Um, so based, based on the seats uh, that we uh, placed 
in, uh, in the room. Uh, for the record, <laughs> we're gonna state that the attendance, um, the actual attendance was approximately 350 uh, for day one, although 411 actually registered. And then day two was a little bit lower, uh, 339 registered online. And based on chairs that were there and what was left, um, because people came and went and uh, difficult to keep track of them. Uh, so we're, we're saying that the actual was approximately 250. So I think this is really good attendance over two days. And, um, and then for the tours that uh, we, we did have um, um, uh, attendees of about 200 or just a little bit under 200 for a total of 12 tours. Um, and I, um, I want to thank the subcommittee uh, members, uh, uh, Mr. Kaiser and Mr. Nelson, um, uh, whom I'd like to invite to add any comments to this report that you would like. Uh, would, would either of you want to add something? I'm trying to be brief, but any others? Dan, you did a great job organizing those tours and Jade, you did a great job being a host and keeping everybody on time. And anyway, it, it was great. So, so thanks. Okay, okay, uh, Member Nelson. Uh, yeah, just uh, to kind of echo everything without being redundant, it was truly a pleasure. And I really enjoyed working with uh, Madam Chair and Mr. Kaiser. Uh, I think special thanks really needs to go to staff member David Newell, who really stepped up and oh, yeah. really kind of um, was our captain and really helped us get this done in Ken Line's absence. Of course, we missed Ken so much, but uh, she's back. And uh, of course, uh, Dick the Cat, if, if he weren't around, uh, none of this would have happened as well as it did. And um, Deborah Hobo, Tom Dole, and of course, uh, Captain Hop really were the strings that kept us all together. So, so thanks. And we did list everybody's, you know, name in the back here because <laughs> there was so many, it's a big team and, and really appreciate, appreciate um, all the support from the city that we had as well. Mr. Lyon. I just want to add my thanks to my coworker, David Newell. Um, thank you so much for stepping in when I was out with the shoulder surgery. And I want to commend the board once again. Uh, this, this symposium every year gets better. And a special gratitude to Dick Burkett for doing such a fine job of handing the baton off to the next group. Um, that handoff and that smooth transition of the amazing behind the scenes uh, work that you all do is what makes this get better every year. And it's that kind of continuity that helps you build a better program every year. So you are all to be really commended on it. Good job. Thank you. So that completes today's agenda. And now are there any comments um, from the board? Other board comments? Member Nelson, Vice Chair Nelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I know we're all hoping for a short meeting tonight, but please bear with me. <laughs> Um, this is really, really, really important. Um, last week, I received an email from uh, one of our homeowners that opened up his home uh, for our tours, uh, Stephen Eccles. Mm -hmm. And uh, he owned, with his partner, the house known as the Randolph Scott residence, even though he didn't own it. But they did a remarkable restoration of this property and as you all know, he was a featured speaker and presenter. Um, he sent me an email uh, basically saying, um, you know, I know we discussed uh, the house to the west of me that's under renovation. And I just wanted to let you know uh, that there's very little left of it. And wondering if they've been approved for what they've done and if they, whether or not they've exceeded what they were approved to do. 
uh, it's basically a teardown now and uh, it's 90% gone. So I have photos of it that show just the framing and you can see that right here. Um, if you look closely, you can see it's just framing now and flat. So um, I'm going to forward this email to Ken Lyon and I've also taken more photos uh, that show uh, what's left of the site. But this brings up a larger question about the movie colony, um, which I think is now becoming endangered. Uh, much of the Las Palmas uh, has lost a lot of its original historic fabric over the last uh, 20 years. And um, the former chair of a cat and I talked behind the scenes and he was able to uh, bring new language to city staff to help strengthen or change the ordinance. But uh, I feel like what's happening in the movie colony is um, a problem right now. Uh, the address of that property was 359 East Belmonte Norte. Um, there was another property on the street, on the corner, on the northwest corner of Belmonte Norte and Via Corte at 480 Belmonte Norte that has also um, been somewhat gutted. The roof still remains and some of the front walls remain, but it's on a prominent corner. And the house across the street from it is uh, from 1937, same year as the Randolph Dodd House and this house that I just showed you the photo of. And that one across the street from 480 is 444, excuse me, 487. And it was the former home of Milton Sperling, who was the one-time secretary of the movie mogul, Daryl Vanek, who lived around the corner on Tamask and was the head of 20th Century Fox. Um, the second owner of that property was uh, the Lyon family, David Lyon, who owned Lyon English Grill and whose son went on to found the Palm Film Film Noir Festival. It's my understanding from research online that it's still in the lion uh, family or uh, friends or whatever, it, it doesn't appear to have sold. But um, people are coming and going at that house through windows and there was junk all around the house, there are mattresses. It is really a travesty. So I would just like the staff to look into this uh, for Mr. Eccles and for the board because I think this is a problem that could eventually get bigger. And with the condition of 487 Belmont Norte, it seems right for a possible fire. I, you know, God forbid, I hate to say it, but I think it's something we need to uh, be aware of. And Mr. Vaught may have more information or maybe Mr. Keelan about the architect of uh, any of those homes. And I'm happy to um, provide them with photos and or addresses if they so choose. Um, the last comment I have today is just to please ask staff to follow up on some of the things that I brought up in board member comments uh, over the last six months or so, uh, especially the Los Palmas Business District. That's something that I would like to see back on our agenda. I'll, I'll reach out to you on that, Jay. Um, if you've not done so already, the one that you mentioned last that had appeared to have been uh, broken into or vandalized, submit a code complaint on that one and then submit the other information to me by email and I'll follow up with you. Thank you. You know, I don't think it's been broken into. I think if they're renting out rooms to various people and those people are coming and going through the windows, it doesn't appear to be... Uh, it doesn't appear to be thieves or vandals. It's, it's a very odd situation, but uh, I may just make a code enforcement complaint. <laughs> Thank you. Any other board comments at this time? Board comments. Okay. Does the staff have comments? Yes, I do. Um, I want to see if I can um, share my screen a minute. I. Um, wanted to bring to the board's attention uh, the, what's happened this past week at the um, community church. So let me see if I can successfully do this.
Can you see my screen, says Orchitrian? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Now, let me see if I can get through this thing. So as you know, the news report went out last week that there was another fire at the community church. This time uh, it occurred in the uh, north building, which was the um, classroom uh, wing of the building that was sort of on the east and north part of the site. I was out there uh, today uh, and took these photos. Uh, the building uh, was um, apparently pretty heavily burned. As you can see the image of the uh, window, the fire department did open the roof in several places in order to relieve the heat buildup in the building, which helps them uh, actually bring the fire under control, but of course does result in damage to the building. Um, this photo on the left is the east elevation of the building. Uh, the north elevation of the building here, you can see where the fire uh, was, um, flames were occurring through the window here, and these are areas in the roof where the fire department opened the roof in order to uh, get the fire, uh, in, the internal temperature of the building down so it didn't um, have a further, um, uh, I can't remember the term they use, but it's like a blow over where the whole interior can ignite if it's, uh, the temperature rises at uh, too high of a level. This is the view uh, looking south. This is the uh, bungalow court to the east and to the right in this photo is where you can see that the um, two-story uh, classroom building had burned. You can see the tower of the uh, main uh, part of the church there over the roof. So um, the uh, fire department and the uh, building department are both still further investigating what the cause was of this fire. Uh, the comment that I heard in speaking with the building official uh, this afternoon was that um, the building uh, survived surprisingly well. Uh, the um, building was built uh, with fire stops, which helped uh, keep the fire from spreading up through the wall cavities. Uh, and fortunately, as you can see, the uh, bungalow courts were um, spared. However, um, you also are aware uh, that the uh, non-designated, non-historic buildings on the parcel have been removed or demolished. But in looking at this site now, there's still a lot of uh, um, material on the site, uh, a lot of trees, a lot of shrubs and debris, uh, a lot of stuff between each one of the bungalows. And um, I had a conversation with the building inspector this afternoon, and it's going to be my recommendation that uh, we go further uh, at the city level and demand that the owner remove all of this combustible material, the trees, the broken wood, um, the dead branches, the bougainvillea, and everything else that's around these bungalows that is nothing but potential tinder for a fire to start. Um, also on the site, part of what's still exacerbating the problem of uh, keeping an eye on it from the perimeter is there are still a lot of uh, demising walls um, between the various parcels that comprise the um, orchid tree property. And the building inspector is, uh, or the building official is contemplating uh, um, declaring them a public nuisance so that we can have the rest of those walls and, um, and uh, debris that's on the site uh, removed um, so that the site is better cleared and provides less places for people to hide and do things that they don't need to be doing on this site. Uh, I also observed today that the swimming pools had water in them. Uh, which is a vector control problem. And I brought that to the building inspectors, or the building officials attention as well. While I was on the site, I uh, walked over and I took a look at the orchid tree in Arch. Um, there's been a lot of uh, concern and worry about this arch uh, through the whole project and that it not be lost and that it somehow be integrated. And I did some review of this the last time we were on the site. And I have some serious questions about the historic integrity of this arch, and I will explain why. Uh, the stonework on this arch uh, matches stonework that is found uh, throughout the entire uh, orchid tree parcel, not only here at the arch, but further to the east, and then some uh, fragments in various wall areas to the north. Furthermore, on the arch itself, there is this that has been inscribed in the concrete. 
and it's somebody's name that they carved into the concrete when it was still wet and notes the, the year of 1994. So that was what first raised my, my um, question about its authenticity. And so I went back into the record and I did some more digging to find out, well, how did we evaluate this at the time that the orchid tree property was uh, before the board for designation? And this is what I found. The building was designated as both class two and class two, one and two components in 2010. The carved initials are 1999. The application was made by a citizen, Cheryl Hamlin, in 2009. It was accompanied by a historic resources report from PRC, PCR services dated 2005. The period of significance for the property is 1915 to 1945. There is no mention in the report of the arch. There was no historic analysis done on the arch. There was no discussion of authenticity and no findings were made by the HSPB based on the criteria in the ordinance to justify its inclusion in the designation. There is no evidence of an HSPB site visit as part of the hearing. And what we learned from reading the public uh, record was that Ms. Hamlin spoke in public comment asking that the arch be included and it was. So I want to do a little bit more review on this, but my reason for bringing it up is uh, that I think it's extremely important that when we look at a property and we begin looking at those things that are the character defining features, that we do our due diligence and make sure that those things that are getting included are in fact historic and are in fact contributing from the period of significance to what is making the property uh, significant. So um, with that in mind, that ends my little, um, my little uh, sharing here. But um, I want to bring this forward uh, for more discussion by the board at some time in the future um, and, uh, and get your, your thoughts about it. And I will provide you uh, some of the um, material that I had found. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is I know that there are a lot of um, reports and things that are backlogged right now because I was out for a few months and um, I am uh, diligently trying to get those together uh, and um, bring them forward. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention was that I had a, um, a wonderful opportunity uh, over the past weekend to um, speak a little bit with Hugh Captor. Mm. And I had a, um, I, I asked you, given that the board has put the golf course clubhouse on its work plan for the year, if he would be willing to talk with me a little bit about the, the building uh, what was his uh, design theories and ideas behind its concept, why it's shaped the way it is, you know, what was in his head back in the 70s when he designed that building. And he gave me a beautiful hour of mm -hmm. talking about what was the genesis of that building. And um, I will be bringing some of that material uh, forward uh, in the staff report uh, when it's time uh, to bring that forward to you for consideration. Uh, that uh, when it does come before you uh, will be handled with a historic resources report uh, as we do with all of the city nominations. Relative to that, uh, we have had um, a long uh, wait on the um, review of the um, Security National Bank, uh, otherwise known as the uh, Union Bank of California or currently named the Union Bank. Uh, the report had been uh, provided uh, by the Palm Springs Preservation Foundation. Um, the owner does not support it. And so, as you recall, the board was asked by PSPF to add it to its work plan and he did. And we took the report uh, out of a um, abundance of caution and forwarded it to a third party uh, historic resources consultant to review it and do a peer review. And they determined that the report did have deficiencies. And so we went forward and had a city initiated a historic resources report done by that consultant, which will um, be forwarded to you shortly. But I wanted to just give you an update on that one. It's been hanging out there for a long time. Um, I also um, did watch a little bit of the um, um, one of the past meetings that I was not able to attend on some of your questions about the Las Palmas Business Historic District. And I think it was particularly around the Simsarian building, uh, which was the office for some time of uh, 
Arthur Elrod. Uh, and so um, I'll have further conversations with you about that um, in the coming months. Um, but I do have a lot on my plate right now, and I'm glad for that. That tells us that uh, the, the community is, um, is keenly aware of its historic uh, resources and um, values. So that concludes my staff report. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Vice Chair Nelson. Yeah, just to the follow up to that great report. Thank you, Ken. Um, uh, just for context, I just wanted to say that the stone arch was originally part of the entryway to the old Manthe uh, cottage, which had been an issue uh, that had been brought before a prior board when this whole site was coming up for review, and then that cottage burned. And that was the first of four fires on the site within the last 13 years. The second was uh, the premium apartment building, which was by Albert Fire that had been moved from across the street. And then of course the first church fire and now the fourth church fire. So in that context, I do support the stone arch being uh, removed because it's truly not a historic contributor. And I think the reason that was given at the time for uh, protection was because it was kind of part and parcel to that little cottage, which is now gone. So the context around that has evaporated. And um, secondly, I was just wondering if staff had heard from the fire department uh, how the fire was started or what the cause was. I think that they're still under investigation on that. I, I have not heard what they believe is the cause. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one more thing on that point. Um, I think it's been clear uh, in the community that um, many of our historic buildings are vulnerable to uh, loiterers and vagrants and, and so forth. And I'm just wondering what kind of policing, if any, is being done at that site and the town and country. Um, I know that code enforcement is responsible for going by these buildings and making sure that there are no breaches, but um, do they report back to staff? Should we, should we ask for a monthly report uh, to the Historic Site Preservation Bureau from code enforcement on you know, what they saw when they went by, you know, the old Robinson building and the church and town and country, just so that we are more uh, aware and in the loop on those things. Well, both the sites, both the town and country center, as well as the Orchardry site have security plans that were actually reviewed and approved by the city council. So there's an obligation uh, of an extra nature on both of those sites that the owners um, are required uh, and I don't believe that they have always been living up to those requirements to maintain those sites, not only in terms of perimeter security, but I believe in the case of the um, Town and Country Center, I believe that they were also required to provide uh, some kind of cameras or motion detectors or something. I, I've, it's been a long time since I reviewed that security plan. But um, David, you've been the project uh, case planner on the orchid tree. I believe that property also had kind of a similar security plan imposed by the city on the property owner, wasn't there? Yeah, there was at one time. Um, and I think that was, you know, that was a while ago, but you're correct. It did have several measures that the applicant was required to adhere to relative to um, regular maintenance, security patrols. Um, I think the orchid tree was even had security patrols regularly during the day and night. So it's unusual to see that someone was able to get inside and it sounds like potentially cause a fire unless it was some other natural event that I don't know how that would happen. But um, yeah, there's a security plan that you know has several measures that they're they were required to adhere to um, involving the fencing, maintenance, cleanup, um, surveillance, uh, things like that. And I think that what might be uh, valuable, I don't know if I want to um, have to be bringing uh, security reports that say security was there every month to the board, but I think what might be appropriate for us at a staff level, and David, we could talk about this more offline, is uh, for the owners themselves to be providing some kind of a, um, a document or a statement to the city signed and notarized as an affidavit that they have been performing um, the security uh, detail that's required of them by the city. Um, 
I can tell you myself, today I went out in order to see, I had driven around the perimeter of it. Um, and um, then I went back at the request of the building uh, official uh, to uh, look at the arch again. And I was able to walk right onto the site through one of the gates that was not locked at all. And so, you know, there is clearly a, a failure on the part of the owner on that site to maintain the site in a secure way. And we've seen this over and over again. So it might be a, a good uh, piece of discussion for us to have at staff level, David, to think about maybe having a, a weekly or a monthly reporting uh, signed by these owners, uh, affirming that in fact, they're, they're doing the security detail that the city required. <laughs> Uh, and I've, there was one other thing I forgot to mention, and I, I don't mean to cut this particular conversation short, but um, the, uh, there's, there's two buildings that are uh, going through uh, renovations and so on from a certificate of approval that was processed at staff level, and that was the um, um, City National Bank building or the Bank of America building, which I saw on uh, social media. They're starting to work on the inside, and I'm eager to see some of the outside work happening. Uh, but I was also asked to do a uh, inspection today of the um, uh, Cody, uh, um, I can't I think of it. Um, why can't I think of the, the um, Cody place? What is Cody, not Cody place. Um, Casa Cody. Casa Cody, thank you. Casa. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, and I have got some concerns. So um, I have contacted the owner and I have notified them that uh, I was not uh, willing to sign off on the building permit. Uh, there are a number of things that are not right on that site. And uh, I've given them uh, some detailed information on how to correct some of them and others of them, I'm waiting for them to bring some solutions back to me. Um, so I just want you to know if anybody does happen to be upon the Casa Cody site, uh, it's not final. Uh, and there are issues that we're aware of, uh, including that the neon on the brand new sign is broken. Uh, so that one is one that I'm, uh, I'm on top of, but um, that's all for now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lyon. So does that conclude um, our comments for this evening? Any, any other uh, comments? Okay. All right. Seeing no further uh, comments or discussion, uh, this meeting of the HSPB is adjourned at 6.33 p.m. to the meeting of Tuesday, uh, June 7, 2022 at 5.30 p.m. So I thank all of you for your participation today, and we look forward to seeing you uh, through the month. Thank you very much. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.